Can you go from blacking out on stage to teaching public speaking for a living? That's exactly what Kyle Bowe did. After a decade of teaching in the classroom, he's now moved online and is the course manager for performative speaking. We talk about Kyle's journey from being that kid in the back of the classroom to being up in front of it, how vulnerability is a form of leadership and finding earnest communities online. I really enjoyed this chat with Kyle and I think you will too. This is the Strangely Earnest Podcast, and I'm your host, James Stuber. Let's hop into the chat. I think that's a, a struggle in general with creativity and, you know, filming videos or podcasts or even blogging um, is having that outline and knowing, like, I think the magic kind of happens in the spaces when you actually take a step back and go, all right, let's just kind of loosen the grip on the reins a little bit and see what happens. But that's when you're not really sure where things are going to go. But I think that's also when the magic happens, right? When you don't like hold on so tightly and you just kind of say, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to step back and we're going to, we're going to see what happens. We're just going to let it, let it rip and see, uh, see where it goes. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think for every one of these podcasts, I've made like a list of questions and I've even like, I didn't send them to you this time, but for previous guests, I've always sent them questions. And then we end up talking about maybe one of them <laughs> and the rest of the conversation is, is just riffing. And it, it turns out, uh, I think a lot more organic and a lot more interesting. Yeah. You know, like you said, when the rains come off. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I think it's good to have a set of questions, especially because you're like, okay, I, I want to have something just in case we do hit sort of a blockage and we go, okay, we've, we've exhausted that area or that topic, or, you know, we went mm -hmm. on some tangent, you know, some little idea tree that went this way. And then we go, okay, well, that's over. You're like, well, okay, well, what now? Right. And then the question gives you something to bring it back to, right. It kind of gives you like a safe place, which is good to have. But also, like, I think if you rely on that, that's when it's just like question, answer, question, answer. And that yeah. format is it just it doesn't feel organic. Right. Like, and you want it to feel organic. And then you also have to trust that some sort of value is going to arise out of that for the people that are going to listen on the back end, which I think that's also part of the scary part is like knowing in our heads that at some point an audience is going to see this or listen to it. And we're like, you know, I want to make sure it's good for them. But. I think you almost end up making it worse by trying too hard to make it good, which is kind of a, a weird paradox. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing worse than listening to a podcast and the, the guest is going on on some like interesting tangents and the host reels it in. You're like, no, I wanted to listen more to what they were talking about, you know? Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's like, you just gotta, you gotta let it go. And that's like Disney frozen. Um, but you do, I think you, you have to let it go. And that's, I mean, that's just a, a good life skill in general is, is more of the active listening into what, you know, that person wants to talk about or your guest wants to talk about on a podcast or even just in life is like listening and then asking them questions that pertain to what they're talking about. And it ends, you're going to end up having more interesting conversations, whether that's on a podcast or just like out in the world, if you're actively listening to what that person is talking about and then asking them follow up questions based on that, instead of being like, okay, you know, whatever you just said, but like, I want to ask you this specific question that's totally unrelated to that actually really interesting thing that you just said, but that's not what I planned on talking about. So let's, let's come back over here. And you're like, yeah, maybe we should have kept going on that one, you know, but I mean, yeah, is what it is. Yeah. I mean, this, this kind of, if you step up from a conversation level to like a, a niche level, you know, we'd both took, we both took Ali's part-time YouTuber Academy. And one of the first lectures was on like finding a niche and drilling, drilling down and getting exactly to what you wanted to be doing. But I think both of us and our friend, Michael Ashkoff were like, well, you know, if, if you drill down too specific to a niche early on, like you're kind of hampering yourself. And also it's, it's not necessarily the best way to figure out what you want to do is yeah. to, to pick early. You know, you've got to, like, you, like in a conversation, you got to pick up on what, what, people are talking about what, what, uh, you know, what they're interested in. And I think it's a similar thing with, you know, YouTube videos or blogging or podcasting or whatever. You gotta, you gotta try stuff and see what your, your listeners or your readers are interested in first. And that will generate something more interesting, I think, than, you know, trying to plan it out all ahead up front. Yeah. Well, I think, Again, it comes back to this. I think we were talking about this before we hit record, this idea of, of planning something out, but having like a loose structure. And so if you're, I feel like if you're too structured in terms of what you want to talk about, you're going to hamper your creativity because you're limiting yourself to like, no, this is my niche. These are my specific topics. And you might then sit down to write and feel yourself wanting to write or talk or go off on something else 
that maybe is resonating with you more at that moment. But you're like, no, that's not my that's not my niche. That's not the thing that I'm supposed to be talking about. And so instead of just kind of letting it happen more organically, more naturally, and like I really think a niche is like an emergent property. Like I think it's yeah. something that emerges out of the act of creation, not something that we can really force. And that's not to say like I understand the value of it, right? Like I understand that I, if you start posting videos that are all over the place all the time on YouTube, people are going to be like, what? Like what am I coming to this guy for? So I do understand that there is value to a niche, but I also think that especially in the beginning, like we can limit ourselves creatively if we're like, no, I need to find my niche. And then we're spending all this time like finding our niche, but we're not actually creating. And if you just focus on the creation, I think the niche will come out of that. And whether that's something that you find, oh, like that's what I really resonate with at the moment. That's what I'm going to talk about. Or it might be something that really resonates with your audience or your community like I like to think about it as community, but you'll find something that resonates with them that maybe you never even thought about talking about. Like I never thought about talking about how to write on Twitter and how to make connections on Twitter. But I found that like whenever I talked about that, people really, really resonated with that. And I was like, I never would have said that's something that I want to talk about, but people, it, but it's, it's valuable to people. And that's something that I only found by just saying, hey, this is how I made connections on Twitter. Like, this is how I used it. This is why it's important and valuable to me and how it changed my life. And people were picking up on that. And I was like, that never would have been the thing that if I had sat down ahead of time and said, what do I want to write about? It wouldn't have been that. And that only came about just by like putting a bunch of stuff out there and seeing what landed with people. Yeah. And that's why I love learning in public so much. It's like, okay, this is something I'm interested in enough to learn about it. Why don't I tell people what I'm doing and you end up getting this, this feedback loop with your community. And it's like, Oh shit. Like people are interested in, in finding friends on Twitter. <laughs> people are interested right. in this stuff I'm talking about. How do you go about being okay with your, your niche or your topics that you're talking about? How do you, how do you get comfortable with trusting that that emergence will come? Cause I think a lot of, I think a lot of would-be creators are afraid to post online because they're like, oh, like I'm just talking about random stuff. How how can I trust that just by talking about random stuff, I'm going to find my niche or I'm going to find what I want to talk about? Yeah, I think that's, a, that's an interesting question. One of the things that I think a lot about and I have been thinking a lot about is the balance between creating for yourself and making it something that you enjoy doing and making sure that you enjoy the process, right? Because if I don't enjoy the creative process, if I don't enjoy the journey, if I don't enjoy the learning process, I'm not gonna keep showing up to do it, right? I'm gonna, mm -hmm. I'm gonna end up stopping because I'm not enjoying it. So if I'm just trying to create something for an audience and I'm only thinking about what they want, well, one that seems like it's gonna be unsustainable for me because I'm not gonna to wanna to keep creating that long-term. Maybe I can do that for six months to a year, blow up on Twitter, but I'm like, if it's not really what I wanna be talking about, is that really gonna bring me joy long-term? Yeah. So I feel like I have to really enjoy the process. So I have to enjoy what I'm talking about. And so I think it starts there where it's like, just talk about what resonates with you and, and figure out how you can frame it for sure. Like I would think about framing it in a way that you're not just like, these are my journal thoughts. like and putting that out there, you can always kind of shift it in a way that adds a little bit of value to the audience. But I would say first and foremost, like just create what you want and create the content that you want to create. And then you just have to trust that you're going to find people. Yeah. I think the other thing that's really interesting is there are a lot of communities and I mean, we're in one, right? And a bunch of overlap between building a second brain, rite of passage, part-time YouTuber Academy. A lot of those communities have a shared value and a shared ethic of learning in public and sharing what you're learning and supporting people on that and just being supportive about their curiosity. And so if you can find those sorts of communities and really embed yourself within those communities where it's not, we're, we're all not learning the same things. Like Michael Ashcroft just today, again, posted about that tea concoction that he's making. Yeah. I would never sit down and learn about that, but I think it's fascinating that he is. And that's because there's sort of a shared ethic in that community of just like learning in public being curious about things and then sharing it. And everybody seems to support one another in terms of just learning stuff. And so I think having that sort of community gives you that permission and really gives you the sort of psychological safety of, I'm going to find people that are going to resonate with this because they're not just resonating with the material, they're resonating with the curiosity. And so that sort of gives you the freedom to be like, oh, okay, I can talk about whatever I want to talk about because people are just supporting me 
and my creation and my evolution, you know, my exploration, my curiosity, not the specific topic. So I think it's like, it gives you that sort of freedom to do that. And then when you find that thing that works for you, well, now you've already had the support to get there. And then I think at that point, it'll, it'll amplify. Yeah. That's what, I mean, that's what I love about this community so much is that we're all so positive and enthusiastic about things. Like if, yeah, if Michael wants to write about tea or if I want to, you know, write about strength training or whatever, it doesn't have to be necessarily something that you're interested, but it's because the person is curious that we're all supportive of that, which I love so much. Yeah. Well, it's, it's like, it's all about, I think it's, I think we all sort of share this idea of self-exploration, right. And really exploring ourselves and exploring our potential and seeing what that looks like in the world. And so we all learn from one another in that way, because we're all sort of sharing that same, that same value. So it's like you learning about strength training is super helpful because I love strength training, but I don't have the time to go out and learn about it because I'm learning about, you know, self-actualization and society and things like that, studying self and self-development. So you doing that helps me. And hopefully I can give a little bit of something as well in terms of how to think about something else differently. And so it's like, we can all kind of come together and it's like this collective hive mind, but individuality is what's encouraged within that hive mind, which is kind of an interesting thing. Yeah. How do you, how do you find, or if you can't find, create a community where there's that psychological safety, where you feel like you can, you can share whatever without judgment or even without any kind of negative negativity like how do you how do you find those communities how do you make those communities yeah so that's something that i think a lot about and that that stems back to my time as a teacher like i was always i, I think it's ted lasso um have you seen that show uh, i don't think so no okay so ted lasso is like a he's a, he's a d2 football coach mm-hmm. that then gets hired by a you know a premier a premier league soccer team specifically just so that he can ruin the team because this woman like inherits it from her ex-husband and she just wants to destroy the team. So she hires this D2 football coach who has no clue what he's doing with soccer just so he can destroy the team. Yeah. And this dude's whole thing is that he's just like a super positive guy. And he's just going to rally people around this idea of belief. And people are like, what that, like, what are you doing, dude? You know nothing about soccer. Get out of here. But his yeah. whole thing is like, we're going to, we're going to rally around belief and then the rest will take care of itself. And that's what I did when I taught was like, I just, I wanted to be positive first and foremost. And I wanted to bring everybody into the conversation, right? Like I wanted to draw people out and say, Hey, we're, this is what we're going to do. So for me, it was about demonstrating the behaviors that I wanted to see out of other people and just doing that and doing it in a way that like, I had to put myself out there and take risks and be like, I'm going to be a little bit over the top. You know, I post that gif all over Twitter, right? The, uh, the little kid hopping around. Yeah. That's because I, I want that energy for people. And I want people to feel that way. And I want people to feel that support. And I think people sort of pick up on that. So I think one, you have, you have to be, you have to do the sort of behaviors that you want to do, right? You have to be the person that you want within those communities. And then second, I mean, there, there are existing communities, right? Rather, whether they're public or private, right? Obviously people have circle communities, people have Slack communities, And then you can leverage those paid and private communities to go into more public spaces. But I think if you're also paying attention, you see that there's a bunch of overlapping communities on open platforms like Twitter, where it's somebody from Nat Eliasson, it's somebody from David Perel, it's somebody from Ali Abdal. And they all sort of bump into each other on public platforms. And so it's it's a bit, because there is a bit of a container on those platforms, right? Because those algorithms kind of shape it and it's not really visual. You don't see it in the same way that you might in a private Slack community, but it's still out there. So I think it's about also following the right people and then engaging with those with their followers in the comments. Or if you're in a if you're in a paid course or in a paid community, leveraging the connections that you're making in those communities and then taking them into the public spaces, which then helps you you know, be able to share and feel comfortable and create that psychological safety in that because it already, that ethic already exists. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because I used to be the type of student who would show up to class and not interact with the community at all. Or if I took an online course, I would, I would, you know, watch the recorded lectures and never hop on the Zoom calls. But I think that really held me back for so long was not connecting with the community, thinking that I could go on it on my own. What would you tell someone who is like me, who is not showing up to Zoom calls, who is, you know, turning off their camera during breakout rooms? What would, what would you tell them? 
Um, first, I hear you and I see you and like I was you. Man, when I was in college, I would come in and I would I would wear a hoodie and a beanie. And this was like because I went I went to school in Jersey, so it was cold, right? This is what I'm thinking. And I would sit in the back row, way in the back, and never say a word. And it wasn't until the dean of the program really like literally grabbed me after class, not grabbed me, but like after class one day was like, You're hiding and you need to like stop. Dang. And I was like, whoa. And she brought me, brought me into her office and called me out and was like, I see the way that you're trying to get through the program. And like me being like, what do you mean? And she was like, you're just trying to take all the easy classes. You're, you're, you're trying to skate by and I'm not going to let it happen. Like I have to sign off on your degree and I'm not going to let you out without challenging yourself. And I was like, wow. whoa. <laughs> um, and I mean, that really helped me. But then because of that, I started teaching and like I was... I mean, so to go from sitting in the back of the room to then having to be the voice in the front was like, yeah. I never wanted to be a teacher, dude. Like I was, like I said, I was way more comfortable being the person in the back of the room than I was being the person in the front. But I realized too, like I can, I can help people that are like me because I understand that it, it's difficult if you've never felt that way. If you've never felt like the type of person that wants to shut off your, you know, your camera in a breakout room, it's hard to understand why that, like why that's happening. Mm -hmm. So for me, part of it was just like, I can talk to those people. I understand that. Like I get that experience. I get why you feel that way. And I want to help people because somebody like yourself, like, dude, you have something to share. Like you have something that can help. You have a story, you have knowledge. And like, I, like, I just love being able to draw that out of people to be like, nah, man, like, it's like, stop hiding and put yourself out there. Like you have something to share. You're like, you're worthy of sharing it. And people want to hear it. Like we want it, you know, and we need it. Um, so I would say that first and foremost, and, and second is like, when I took David Perel's rite of passage in June, that was something because I, I had changed sort of the, the ethic and the way that I participated in online courses, right? I started, I mean, I was teaching, but in online courses, I wasn't so active and outgoing. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to totally flip that this time. I'm going to see what happens. And I was in the chat, like being super active, like maybe a little bit too much because I'm definitely a little bit over the top in the chat, but I think I'd rather be over the top and, and be a little bit out there and dial it back a little bit than not doing it at all. But it's, I was like, I'm going to make connections. Like I, this is what I'm here for this time. Like I'm going to, I'm going to engage in the community and doing that has changed my life. Like literally you got a new career, got a new job you know, move to Austin, have made tons of friends, have connections with yourself. Like it changed my life. Yeah. And so like that, I mean, I would just say like, just, just try it, you know, and, and you got to maybe start small, you know, maybe just, you know, one breakout room, right? Like just, just try with somebody, like just try to connect with one or two people, right? You don't have to be like me popping off in every chat and going crazy, but I, I would say just give it a go. And there is a point where, you know, people ask, how do I, how do I get more comfortable doing that? Or like, how do I do it? And there, there is a point where you say like, you just got to do it. Right? Like you just yeah. got to try it. And what I would say is that I think what stops a lot of people, at least what stopped me was the fear of judgment and, and not thinking like I had something to contribute. And one, again, I had something to contribute. And two, the people in these courses either are feeling the same way or B, want to hear what you have to say. And that's what that, that's what those communities are there for. The people that are in them want to, like, they want to connect. They want to hear what you have to say. So those two ideas of like, I'm not worthy and no one cares. It's like, well, they're, they're not true. I mean, they're objectively false, especially within the communities that, you know, we're talking about and that we participate in. Yeah, that, that's awesome. I mean, I had a similar experience when I took building a second brain and I started connecting with people and everyone was free from, from judgment. It was like, okay, like, hey, yeah, we're all struggling with this content. Like, it's really like mind bending. <laughs> like yeah. it's it's yeah. giving people permission to like talk about what they're struggling with, to share their experience, like dealing with this stuff is so, so huge. Yeah, well, and I think about, do you remember in our Twitter group for part-time YouTuber Academy, the one day Alex went in there and was like, I'm struggling. Yeah. And I was like, oh, and then I was like, I typed something. And then I think Mark said something. And then I think Jen said something. And like, just because Alex was like, I'm struggling. Like we were all like, I, at least I was like, oh, me too. Like, I thought I was yeah. the only one. Like, thank you so much for saying that because like, it makes me feel normal. And it made me realize like, when I'm struggling with content like that, when I'm struggling to keep up in a course, especially like, 
I'm like, I'm a teacher. Like I should be smart. I should be keeping up, you know, like I shouldn't yeah. be having this problem. Right. Then you start all the thing, you start getting into the shoulds of what you should and should be doing and how you should be whatever. But then you realize like when somebody like that steps out and says it, you're like, Oh, okay. We're all feeling this way. It's designed to make you feel this way. It's designed to challenge you. It is a lot, but everybody else is experiencing that. And maybe some are not everybody, but quite a few people are also experiencing the same thing. And I think just knowing that sort of normalizes it where you're like, Oh, okay. This is like, especially with building a second brand for me, man, that was a paradigm shifting course. Like that was a whole different way of being and existing in the world. So the first time I took it, I was like, what, <laughs> yeah, like, what just what, happened? What do you mean? And I was like, I know. And it, it just, it flipped the whole world for me because it wasn't even just about storing knowledge. It was about changing how I interacted with the world. Yeah. And so of course I'm going to struggle with shifting a pack. Like, yeah, obviously like that's a massive thing to go through. And it's not going to happen in two weeks. It's just not. Other people are feeling these feelings that you are feeling. And if you are able to have the courage to bring that up and to say, hey, I'm struggling with this course. Hey, like I'm feeling overwhelmed right now. That's such a huge moment for everyone else who is feeling the same way. It's like such a big deal to realize that other students in your class are going through the same thing, that it's okay to be struggling. You know, you don't have to put on this face of, oh, I'm, I'm perfectly learning all this stuff and I'm on top of it and I'm, I'm going to be so awesome now. <laughs> you know, it, it's okay to be like, this is like breaking my brain and I can't, I can't even handle it right now. Like I gotta, I gotta step back. That's totally cool. Yeah, man. And that's, again, that comes back to like why I love teaching public speaking and why I love the perspective that I had on it. Because I, I mean, I had public speaking anxiety, you know, the first time that I ever gave a teaching demo, I blacked out. Like it, it was, dude, yeah. it was a week before I was supposed to start teaching and it was a 10 minute, it was supposed to be a 10 minute demo. Mine lasted three minutes and I, I blacked out and I, it was awful and it was historically bad. And I found out at least the next year that he used me as an example and was like, Hey, don't worry about how bad you do. You'll never be as bad as that guy. And we still, <laughs> and we still let him work here. And I was like, one cool. Um, but I, I mean, I, I ended up loving it and I ended up being you know pretty good at it and, and really enjoying it. But because of that experience, I mean, it's like, it, it's normal and it's, it's a part of the process for a lot of us. And some of us will grasp material. And there are people that are really comfortable with an idea like public speaking right off the jump. Same thing with a, a course like building a second brain. There's some people that are just going to wrap their head around that content right away. But there's also a surprising number of people that are going to be struggling and by you saying, hey, I'm, I'm struggling with this. It's like you actually end up becoming a leader in the community by just by just being vulnerable because people go like people rally around that and people start opening up. And like just by you saying, man, this is this is hard. And like maybe I'm not used to things being hard. Like I'm, I'm used to like understanding difficult material easily. But this is really, really challenging. All of a sudden, like other people get that permission to open up, too. And it's like now you're now you're like a leader almost just because you're being vulnerable. And I, I think that's also a, a shift in leadership as well, like. A shift in how we conceptualize leadership it's not about knowing everything it's just about having the courage to empower other people yes love it tell me more about that shift from blacking out in front of your, your presentations to being a you know a confident speaker and a, a confident teacher yeah man um it's been a journey uh so the so just to tell you a little bit about the story of how i even became a professor so i got into grad school and I was looking up jobs in San Diego because I was moving from New Jersey to San Diego to go to San Diego State for my master's. And I was like, San Diego's expensive, man. I, I, I can't move out there with no job. You know, I didn't have much savings. I was like, I need, I need something to land with so that I have some sort of income. And as I'm on Craigslist looking for jobs, I get an email from the director of the program going, do you want to teach public speaking? And I'm like, <laughs> One, have you guys seen my transcripts? Because I got an F the first time I took public speaking because I was so terrified that I went to the particular number of courses, could no longer drop it and then stopped going because I was so scared of it. And then I retook it my final semester of college because it was mandatory and you had to take it. So I was in it with a bunch of freshmen and I did the bare minimum work that I could to pass. Like I literally calculated it out that I was like, oh, I can, I can skip these activities and this speech and still get a C minus, which is good enough to pass. Perfect. Nailed it. And then I get that email that's like, do you want to teach public? And I'm like, what, what, what transcript have you seen? Like, what are you, like, what are you seeing that I'm not? But I was like, well, screw it. How, how hard could it be, right? In my youth, obviously, the hubris of being like, how hard could it be? I hated taking the class. I guess I'll teach it. Couldn't be that. Yeah. So I said, yeah. 
And then I got out there and, you know, the week before you have to do a training, you know, a training seminar. So it's a week long thing about everything that you need to know about teaching. It's, you know, it's again, it's like a fire hose that all just comes at you. It's protocols and safeties and structuring your lectures and lessons and how to structure a course and learning objectives. And at the end of it, the end of the week, you have to give a 10 minute teaching demo. And I was one of the last people to go. So all week long, because like I'm one of those people that if there's a speaking thing, even now, I'm like, let me just get it over. Like, let me just let's just do it. Like, let me rock it. I don't want to think about it. I just want to, I just want to go. And I was one of the last people to go. So all week long, dude, I am dreading doing this thing. And I'm like, how am I going to do it? I've, I've got it planned out. I'm like, okay, it's going to be awesome. We're going to do it. Like, here we go. And then he calls my name and I forget everything. I start my lecture and I, I remember like writing a word on the board, trying to generate a discussion and then the next thing that I remember, I came to and I was shaking, trying to pass a marker to somebody, to the next person that was supposed to go. And I was like, what just happened, dude? Um, and afterwards, the director of the grad student like program for the teachers like just came up to me and was like, man, like, don't worry about it. Like, you know, put his hand on my shoulder and was like, you're going to be all right. Like, you're going to be fine. Because like in my head, I'm like, okay, if I just leave now, like, if I just bail, like if I just go back to Jersey, no one will ever know this happened. These people will forget about it. No one will ever need to know but he was like, you're going to be fine. And after that, it was, it was putting the reps in, like just really just like doing it. You know, my first class was a bit rough, gave people the syllabus. It lasted maybe 15, 20 minutes. And I was like, okay, this is a bit rough. This is a bit rough, but eventually I started to love it. And I started to realize that it was less about, at least for me, when I taught, it was less about me and it was more about a conversation with all of us. And that took a little bit of the pressure off me that it's like, oh, it's not just about me. Like, I don't have to be the perfect leader. Like, I want to generate a discussion in a classroom full of people. I want to lift everybody up. And then the other thing that really motivated me was seeing people, seeing the transformation that people had. You know, seeing people that on the first day of class, you'd be like, all right, just go up front, like introduce yourself, say your name, say where you're from, your major. And like, because I was teaching college freshmen at the time, like what you hope to get out of college over the next four years, like what you're really excited for. And you would see people that on day one would go up there and it would be like, you know, 15 seconds, they would be shaking the whole time and they would be like, uh, and they would forget to tell people like their name. And I'm like, by the way, like, who are you? Like that was the whole point of the exercise. You didn't introduce yourself to anybody. Like, let's do that. And then by, you know, three months later, four months later, they're giving an eight to nine minute speech. And maybe it's not perfect. You know, maybe it's not, maybe there's some things that we can still improve, right? They're not Barack Obama. But to see that shift in just three to four months, I was like, man, that, that person is completely, that's, it's so much bigger than public speaking. That person is transforming themselves. And I really fell in love with that. And again, that was just, you know, getting the reps in, like just getting them up there and getting comfortable and doing what I could to let them know that it's like, dude, it's okay. Like we struggle, like there's a lot of people that struggle with this thing, especially public speaking. There's a lot, a lot of people that struggle with it. Um, but for me, it was seeing that sort of journey in people and knowing that I could be some small part of that, that really made me fall in love with public speaking and teaching in general. And was like, whatever fear I have about doing this, I have to work through. And the mantra that really, you know, really, really helped me was get comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And so even like, even as I teach, like I still, now I shift to YouTube and putting videos out there or podcasts. And I still kind of get that voice in my head of like, oh, nope, you're not good. No one's going to care. And I'm like, dude, I've talked for a decade now and I'm still getting that voice. So it's like, I don't think that voice ever really goes away. Yeah. And it's just about learning to be like, nah, like, you, like I'm, I'm going to do it. Like I'm my, my discomfort zone is my comfort zone. And when I'm comfortable, not to say I don't like enjoy chilling on the couch or whatever, like watching a movie, but like when I, when I'm too comfortable, when I'm stagnant, that makes me uncomfortable. And so it's about reframing for me. It was about reframing my relationship to growth and challenging myself and realizing like, if I want to live a big life and I want to live a life of impact, I have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, so I think that answers your question. Yeah, no, great. There's, there's a saying that's, you know, it, it, it's not that the bravest knight is not scared. It's that he's scared and he does it anyway. I love that. Yeah. Well, and that's, I think that's the concept of courage and bravery. I think we mistakenly assume that it means that you don't feel fear. 
Yeah. But to me, courage and bravery is about feeling the fear and, and doing it anyway and being like, no, the fear is there, but I'm not going to succumb to it. Like, I'm going to feel it. And I'm going to keep going. And if anything, I'm going to use that fear as fuel to do better. Like, I'm going to let it drive me and I want to prove myself wrong. Like an hour from now, I want to look back and be like, Kyle from an hour ago was totally wrong about that. I just crushed that interview. You know what I mean? Like, I want to almost yeah. prove myself wrong and prove whatever audience I think is doubting me wrong. Like I want to let that fuel me and I want to like dri- use that to drive me to do better. Love it. Tell me about your transition from teaching public speaking in a university setting to helping teach this online. Yeah. So for me, it got to a point when I graduated from, you know, my master's program, realized that I love teaching I was an adjunct faculty member doing what they call like being a freeway flyer in San Diego, which is driving from community college to community college to community college, Oof. right? All over the place all the time to make like four grand a month, right? And not that it's about the money, but I was like, Oof, this is a lot of work for not a lot of money. And the more professors that I spoke to, the more that I sort of realized that's not the game that I want to play. And it's because I would hear stories of them saying things like, you know, I worked on this research paper and it's got four views, you know, and they'd spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours getting these research papers into these journals. And maybe the people in that community would view it. And then another five people would view it. And like something there just seemed off to me. Like it seemed like there was a way that we could amplify that impact. And I, I started looking for it. And one of my final semesters teaching, one of my students was like, have you ever thought about posting on YouTube? And I was like, honestly, no. Um, At the time, I'd never, I didn't really watch videos on YouTube. I never consumed content on YouTube. Like it just wasn't the way that I did things or thought about things. And he was like, because there's this whole movement to like educate people on you. And I was like, whatever. But like went home and like looked at it. I was like, this kid, cause like, I remember YouTube from like the muffin video, you know what I'm talking about? Like one of the first viral videos where it was like, that's how I thought of YouTube, where I was like, it's memes and cat videos. Yeah, like silly things. Right, right. And like, no no judgment on that. Like whatever, that's, if that's what you're into, like, cool. But like, I never thought about it as a vehicle for education. But then I started to look into it and I was like, whoa, like there's something happening here. Like there's a whole movement around this that, you know, it's, it's aligned incentives because if, I think, and there's a lot, like, I'm not one of those people that, you know, shits on college and shits on education and those institutions and the teachers within them, because there's a lot of teachers that really, really, really care about their students and are making way less money than they should and are doing it just because they want to positively impact lives. But for me, then I look at YouTube and I go, whoa, like the incentives are totally aligned here because you can make a big impact. And in fact, the more impact that you make, the more money you make, the more people yeah. you reach and you can reach an almost infinite audience at this point, you're gonna, your, your income is going to scale with that. And then there's potential to collaborate with other people and reach people that you never would have reached within the institutions that you're in. And that, that opportunity to me was just way too exciting. I was like, there, like there's something massive happening here. And we can give edu- like more people access to this information. And you know, not that that's the main driver, but it definitely doesn't hurt. We can make more money while we're doing it. Like that's you know, it's kind of a nice, kind of a nice little bonus as well. Um, and so those were the, that was kind of the impetus to to shift my focus and to shift like wh- like what I was doing and, and where I was showing up and you know the games that I wanted to play in the world. Uh, yeah, I've been in a similar space. I was always like, oh, YouTube is just just for silly videos and, and entertainment and having fun. And when I was sharing my stuff about productivity online, I was like, okay, well, people who are into productivity read blogs. So I'm going to write a blog. And I never even thought about putting stuff into a video, even though for a lot of these, a lot of these productivity systems, it makes more sense to show a video of you doing the process or the workflow, whatever. Right. And it wasn't until like a lot of these productivity YouTubers like like Thomas Frank and Matt Diavella and Ali Abdal started blowing up that I was like, wait, there's there's people who who watch YouTube for productivity and like, oh shoot, like why am I not doing this? Like and it's 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 been really uh, an interesting journey into like getting comfortable on camera and getting used to you know, making videos and figuring out what that all looks like. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it is. I mean, that's the other thing too, is just having fun with it. It's 
when I like, I mean, so I started with YouTube like what five weeks ago with you. Yeah. yeah. When I first started, man, I made it about the gear and I totally locked myself into that trap of not having the right light, not having the right microphone, not having the right camera and ended up making it all about that and not having fun with it. Um, and so it's for me now, it's about coming, coming back to just having fun with it and, and shooting something that's fun and reducing the friction of it and just having a blast with it. But yeah, man, I can imagine because like I'm thinking about it, I'm like, man, Notion, for example, Notion is an incredible, incredible productivity tool. But if I were to read a blog and just a blog about how to wrap my head around Notion, I'm, I would be like, what? Like, it would come back, come back to the idea of breaking my brain. So there's, there are so many things that just make more sense visually. And it's also just a great way to, to get information. And there's also a whole new generation of learners that might resonate more with YouTube, right? And maybe the traditional education system just isn't designed for them. And so it gives them an outlet to still go get the information that they want and to be able to teach themselves and to be able to learn what they want to learn. It's like, and it's out there. Yeah, it's it's a crazy mind shift to think that learning can actually be fun or entertaining. Like it doesn't have to be this like serious slog where you're going to lecture or you're reading a textbook. You can actually watch YouTube videos that you want to be watching and, and figure out this stuff on your own in a way that's, fun and generative but i think learning i think learning should be fun like and i think yeah. i mean i i think it is fun i have fun with it but i think it should be and it's, it's again it's going to be hard to really learn something and to stick to the process and commit to the process of learning if you're not having fun with it like if you hate doing it it's going to be really really hard to show up and, and keep doing it and to keep making the mistakes and to learn from them and grow if you're not having fun with doing it you're not going to keep showing up, you know? So it, I think it, I think it has to be fun. I think it should be at least. I agree. I think that, you know, you have to show up to, to learn it at all. And if you're not showing up, then it doesn't matter how perfect your system is or how optimized your, your learning strategy is if you don't show up and the way to show up is to make it fun, make it fun. Yeah. Well, and that's a, that's a productivity trap that I think a lot of us fall into. Or a lot of us have fallen into. I know I've fallen into it myself. Yeah. That's like, I'm going to spend, 35 hours designing the perfect system and then I'm done with it. And I'm like, perfect. And then I never use it. I'm like, all right, exactly. And then you're like, okay, cool. What's the next system that I can design? And you're like, wait, so you're designing all of these productivity systems, but you're not actually using them. It's like, you'd be better off just showing up, like just going and then, you know, letting the system, like shaping the system around that, like not worrying about getting the perfect system up front. Cause you don't even know what the, what the perfect system is going to exactly. be. Exactly. And that, that's such a huge, a huge thing is we all think we can design these systems up front and then like they'll magically be the best thing ever. But like you said, the best way to do it is to start doing stuff, you know, do the things that you want to be productive about, you know, if it's making YouTube videos or if it's, uh, you know, sending out more emails or whatever your, whatever your goal is, the, the best way to do it is just start with something as simple as possible. And then on the way you'll find like, oh, like I actually need a, a task manager to keep track of all this stuff or, you know, I need a, a place to store all my notes and th this sort of thing comes organically and it, it emerges, you know, just kind of in a similar way to when we're talking about like your niche emerging just from following your interests. It's, it's a similar thing. Like you, you show up, you do the work and this stuff evolves and, and turns into the perfect productivity system. It's not, not something you start and just magically have. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think it, I think it goes against the way that we try to envision things is I think we, we try to plan and I don't know if this is like, you know, kind of a lizard brain sort of thing in terms of trying to wrestle back some control where we're like, we're going to, I'm going to plan the perfect system and I'm going to plan exactly how I do it. Yeah. Instead of, for me, like I think about it in terms of nature, like nature doesn't design systems ahead of time. It just, that's evolution. It evolves and it's constantly, it's constantly adapting to what it learns from its own environment. And so it's like, I think, I think if we can treat it similarly and maybe have a, I mean, have a loose structure, right? Have it have somewhat of an objective. And this is, this is a Michael Ashcroft thing, right? Where he says clear intentions loosely held. Yeah. I think if we use that same idea for, for our creative processes, we're probably going to be better off if it's like, you know what, I'm just going to go and then I'll, I'll shape it as I go. And it's like, for me, yeah, I can sit there and design the perfect system for, you know, when I have a team that I'm outsourcing YouTube videos for. But again, if I'm not creating the YouTube videos 
for the team that I don't have, the system doesn't matter. Like, and I'll get the system as I go. I can probably build it out better, like one by one, instead of being like, I'm going to have this perfect system and then never using it. It's like, why don't I just go and see, and I'll learn what I need and trust that it'll evolve as I go and trust myself to develop it as I'm going along. Yeah. You know, we talk about gear. I, I, I went on like a three month trip to Asia where I was backpacking and I was like, okay, I'm going to vlog the whole thing. And what I did was I spent just hours and hours researching gear and like, what was the best, you know, microphone what was the best, the best vlogging camera and the best, like, you know, carrying case and all this stuff. Just, I, I probably, I'm like, I'm like embarrassed to say how many hours I spent, but it was probably like upwards of a hundred hours just studying gear. And, then- and what, <laughs> You know, in the first week, I was like, shit, like I got the wrong camera. Okay. And what I should have done was start cheap with, you know, like my phone or whatever and tried vlogging while I was still at home. Right. What I should have done was make, make these vlogging videos while I'm at home, figure out the workflow. And then from there, I could have been like, oh, you know, okay. So like this kind of camera would be way better than, you know, my phone or this kind of microphone would be way better than, uh, you know, whatever I was using. And I think I would have not only saved a lot of time, I would have gotten the reps in practicing, making videos, and I would have, you know, not bought the wrong camera in the end. Right, for sure. Well, yeah. that's, it's it's funny because it's, it's often when I hear myself give other people advice that I'm like, that's damn good advice. I should probably take that. And <laughs> Paul LeCron posted on Twitter the other day, I want to, I want to get a better camera. What one should I get? And I want, I want to be able to carry it around. And I was like, man, just use your phone. Yeah. And I was like, wait, I was like, I'm, I've been worried about, uh, do I have the right camera I got? And I was like, you know what, man, like, I'm just going to start shooting videos with my phone. And then this morning I like, I decided that yesterday cause I heard myself say it to him and I was like, Hey, like getting a better camera is a worthwhile investment, but the best investment that you can make right now with your time is creating like, and like, I've done that too. Like I've spent hundreds of hours, dude. It's embarrassing to say it's yeah. awful. It's, there's a bit of shame, but I sort of feel like, huh, okay. I sort of feel a little bit better. I've spent hundreds of hours worrying about the right gear, the right systems, the right softwares. And that's all time that I could have just spent getting better at yeah. what I was trying to do. And it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, there's this quote, forget where it comes from, but it's like, the best guitarist in the world can make a shitty guitar sound good, but the worst yeah. guitarist could take the best guitar in the world and they're not going to know what to do with it. So if you were to give me the best camera in the world right now, I would have no clue how to use it. So why am I spending so much of my time trying to find the best camera when what I should be doing is just creating? Exactly. And that's, Again, I think it's just a trap of productivity where we're tricking ourselves into thinking that we're being productive because we're like, I'm just going to, I'm going to spend a, you know, look at me working so hard. And it's like, no, like yeah. we're probably better off just shooting on our phones and fig- and again, figuring it out as we go. It all comes back to this idea of like psychological safety. I think yeah. a lot of the reason we, we, we latch onto like gear and stuff is it feels like something we can control. It's like, oh, I can control whether I use a phone or I, I use the Sony a7S 5000, whatever. And making videos is something that's a little scary and out of our control. So instead yeah. of doing the thing and making the video, we latch onto the gear, we latch on to, you know, the process, the system, whatever it is. Well, and I think, and that, that, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. That, that's what I, that's one of the things I really liked about Ali's part-time YouTuber course was that he made it explicit that your first hundred videos are going to suck. And if your first hundred, if you know your first hundred videos are going to suck, then it takes off that pressure of, of making it a perfect video. It, it becomes a, it, it almost makes it easier to just go ahead and start making videos, even if they're on your iPhone in a poorly lit room, you know, it's like, it doesn't matter because your first hundred videos are going to suck. <laughs> like yeah. just, just go do it and you'll figure it out. Yeah. And that's coming back to what you said earlier. It's like, I, I think what I'm realizing now is in some ways I, and maybe we see the gear as an extension of ourselves. And so it's like, oh, if I have the best possible camera at the price level that I have, I'm going to be better. Like it's going to like, it's, it's almost an insecurity that we're wrapping around the gear that we have. And I'm like, oh, if I have better gear, then those insecurities are going to go away. And then you still set up the thousand dollar camera that you got. And you're like, oh, the insecurity of shooting is still here. Yeah. 
the judgment, the potential for judgment when I put that video out is also still there. It hasn't gone away just, and then you kind of go, oh, so why, again, I spent all this time. But I think for me, that was part of it is seeing the gear as an extension of me and going, okay, if I have the best gear possible, then that little insecurity, that little voice that I have in the back of my head is going to go away. And yeah, I remember Ali, I think it was in court in day one of the course, or it was early on when he showed it's MKBHD, right? Did I get that right? Showed his hundredth video. And it was like a grainy, like desktop, like it just not a great video. Um, and it, and like that dude is making millions of dollars a year and his hundredth video was hot garbage. And so you go, okay, like if that dude's hundredth video was garbage and that's where he's at now, okay, cool. Maybe, maybe creating 100 hot garbage videos is a part of the process. Yeah. It's, it's not, it doesn't mean that I'm bad. It means that I'm learning and I'm evolving. And I think that that part of it has been key to see like, it's, it's just a part of the process. Like it's not about you being bad at the thing. It's about the process of you getting better at it. Yeah. And here's the thing. People love watching people on a journey. There's nothing more exciting than to, to follow someone on their journey to getting better. I, th I think if you come across a channel and it's just like perfectly polished, like from day one, you're just like, okay, it's like some boring, like corporate, whatever. Right. But if you watch, if you watch a journey of, of someone, a real person who has real struggles, who's trying to figure stuff out, it's so much more engaging to, to follow along with their journey and, and to like, you almost want to cheer them on and like hope they get to, you know, a million subs, 10 million subs, whatever it is. Yeah. Well, and it's like, it's kind of that, that hipster notion of being like, I was one of their early fans. Um, yeah. And it, but it, it is though, it's, I think it's more relatable to just be like, like, Oh, this, this person's just like me. Or they're yeah. just like, they're just like I was, you know, because there are people like Ali. And I think it's a lot of people like him sharing that story of being like, no, when I first started, I wasn't this. Like this took time. Like I was bad. And even him showing the homework assignment or him doing a filming a video and being like making mistakes. And, and then the next day he posted it and it had like 10,000 views. And I was like, what, what? Like, and seeing that was like, again, it was one of those things that kind of shattered it. And you're like, oh, it, it's just a part of the process. But you're right, man. Like we, we love being on that journey with people. And if anything, like you said, we were more invested in the journey when we see that they're making improvements and when they're trying hard and when they're being honest and they're going, I'm struggling. And you go, I'm a human. I struggle too. I struggle every day, man. And you go, oh, okay. Like this person's totally relatable. Maybe their camera quality is garbage. You know, the first time that I ever put up my soft box or light box dude it was flimsy and it was limp and i put it up all wrong and my buddy kevin hit me up kevin shen um i think it's kevin shen hit me up and was like dude let's get on a call like let me help you get that right <laughs> and it, like i figured it out so much quicker and it was because i was like this is awful i know i didn't do this right like this is terrible but i'm still stoked i got it and then he reached out yeah. to help so not only is he now supportive, but he was like, dude, I can, I can help you out. Like, let me, let me, let me speed you up a little bit on this. Cause that thing is not set up properly at all. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. You know, I think if, if like the, the five years ago version of me had made that same mistake and was like, I can't figure out how to set this thing up. I wouldn't have told anyone I would have hit it. Cause it's like, Oh, I'm like, I'm so dumb. I can't even set up a light box, you know, <laughs> like uh, it's, it's crazy how, being okay with sharing your struggles online like brings in so many more people who want to help you yeah well and like you're right i mean the, the five year ago version of me would have been like nope don't put that picture out there like yeah. i was like there's no way that i was doing it right and dude it's it's funny like this is just something about me that i've noticed like there are certain things that are like tiny little like what are everyday like easy things like he told me oh dude it's like a tent pole you have like you have to put it into the hole and yeah. i was like I didn't even know that. Like I was totally overlooking. And he was like, yeah, dude, like once you do that, it'll just open up. And I was like, ugh. But, like I can also like go and talk about like chaos theory or something like, so I can talk about this really high level stuff, but something, something as small as that, I'm like, I just overlook it. I'm like, you know what? Like I've just had to embrace that. That's just part of it. That's just me. And if, and instead of sitting there and calling myself stupid, just be like, dude, like this is, this is your first time doing something with this. Like, and people spend it might look effortless for somebody like Ali, but that's because he's put in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours to get there. Like he has earned it looking effortless. I haven't earned it. And so if, you know, if part of it is like looking a little foolish because I didn't treat it like a tent pole and just put it in the hole, 
you know, that's, that's part of it, man. And like, for me, I laugh about it. And I almost think about it. Like, I think about like B rabbit from eight mile, right. Where he's like, he raps and he, he, in that, in that final one where he just puts everything out there. And it's like, what, like, go tell them something they don't know about me. And he's yeah. like, he just puts all of his problems out there, all of his struggles. And then goes now tell him something. And you go, so as an audience, if you go, this dude's owning his struggles, like it, it kind of takes the power away. Cause you're like, yeah, go ahead. Make, make fun of it being put up wrong. I already know that I've already made the joke about it. Like you got nothing. You can't hate on me because I've already told you what you were going to say. And I don't even care because it's part of the process. And so it almost takes the power out of that thing. And then again, as an, as an audience, you kind of go Ugh, like, dude, set up the light, right? Like, come on, like, what are you doing? You're right. And they, they kind of laugh at it with you because you're in on, you're, you're in on the joke. Like you're, you're, it's just a part of it. Um, and I think again, man, like sharing that with people gives other people permission. And also like looking at other people's light boxes, I was like, I got to figure, I got to figure this out. <laughs> got to make it work. Yeah. I love it. And it's, you know, no matter how good of an expert you get at one aspect of your life, you're always going to have a part of your life where you're not an expert, where you don't know how to do things so where, you know, you make simple mistakes. And I think it's so important to be okay with that. And, yeah. you know, when you're okay with that, you give other people a chance to help. You gave your friend Kevin a, a chance to help you out. And now he felt better about his day because he, he showed you how to do that thing. And yeah. uh, it, it's really, really a, a great way to build more positivity into people's lives. Well, and like worst case, I mean, we had like an hour and a half long phone call. And then he asked me some questions because he, had, he was struggling with some things or thinking about some things about, you know, how to film videos better. So it's yeah. like, he was asking me about public speaking skills. So I'm like, oh, I, I can totally help you with that. Like, I, and I'm happy to answer questions about that. And so now it becomes a sort of reciprocal process, a give and take, but at worst, like I've made a friend. And yeah. so if me looking silly for a little bit helps me make like a lifelong connection with someone or just a friendship, like, I, I think that's worth it. Like I, I'm willing to risk looking silly for a little while to like meet somebody new and someone that could potentially change my life. And if like all that takes is posting a flimsy looking softbox on the internet, like so be it, man. Like it's, it'll, it'll be fine. Love it. Well, we're coming up on about an hour. It's been um, an hour already. I know, seriously, dude, we should, yeah, we need to chat more, have another down. talk at some other point. Um, down. Yeah. Where can people find you online? Uh, I would say Twitter is the easiest spot. It's where I'm most active. I have not been diligent about posting on my blog. I'm stepping up my YouTube game. Just filmed a video right before go this. Subscribe. So posting on YouTube. Go subscribe to that. Smash that subscribe button. Follow yeah. me. Follow my journey. I'm doing my best to share and share vulnerably and authentically. Uh, but I would say definitely if you hear this and you want to connect with me, go on Twitter. It's KyleBo4. And like, I love talking to people on Twitter. I love meeting new people. So like DM me, message me, follow me, do whatever you got to do, but definitely connect. But I would say go to Twitter for sure. Start there. Well, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, man. I appreciate it. Thanks yeah, for having me. It's been great. Yeah. yeah. See you around. That, that was a fake yeah. ending. I'm just... I, was like, I was like, do I bounce now? I was like, I don't know what I do. <laughs> All right, I should warn you. I thought it was. I was like, wait, do I leave? I was like, I should. I feel like I should wait. Okay. <laughs> this, this should be the actual ending right now.